very happy to have you, know, you and I've talked through the camera, but we've never really had a chance to sit down face to face. But I'm joined right now by Jazra Singh Hallen, the Conservative Party finance critic as well as the MP for Calgary Forest Lawn. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be live in person with you and great to be here amongst so many excited and energized Conservatives in the thousands that came out for this grassroots uh, convention that we have. It's common sense grassroots conservative uh, convention. Well, you know, I, I, I have some questions here for you, but in the discussion before, uh, while Andrew was speaking, we were having our own discussion, and you said this is the first Conservative Party convention that you've actually attended? Absolutely. So, so what's that been like? Is it what you expected it was going to be? Uh, it's been beyond expectations. I mean, you know, it's after eight years of Justin Trudeau, we're not only hearing about the frustration all across Canada, but we're seeing our grassroots, the people, you know, that come to this convention that are really the people that made our party. They're the ones who are our donors, our supporters. They're the ones who, you know, they, they literally go door to door with us. They hammer in the signs. These are the people that are, are the reason why we're here today. We're here because we're a grassroots party and we're seeing so much excitement for our new leader, Pierre Polyev. Uh, my expectation was already uh, that I was going to see just a, a lot of excitement. And I've just been blown away at just how uh, excited, but how passionate our grassroots people are. Well, certainly the polls are in favor right now. They have been all summer. It's been uh, encouraging for Conservative members. We keep hearing that as we, we speak to people these past few days and today as well. Uh, and of course, affordability is a big issue. You, you keep hammering on it, but I, I wonder if we can get into sp some specifics because we know, and this has been very clear, it keeps being repeated time and again, this party is promising to cut the carbon tax. But how else will Conservatives address affordability? Or is it all tied into that one promise to get rid of the carbon tax? Cutting, axing the carbon tax, getting rid of it is one part of bringing down affordability. We know that the carbon tax not only is inflationary, and the Bank of Canada's governor admitted to that, and we've been saying that all along for many years, but on top of that, it hasn't accomplished anything that the Liberals said it would accomplish. First of all, they said that the carbon tax would, the, they would, that the more you pay into it, the more you would get back. We know through the public budgeting officer that that was false, and that more Canadians are gonna pay into it than what they get back. We also know that they've never hit a single emission reduction target. They got close last time around, off by 1.8%. And let's be real, there's no correlation between a carbon tax and raising the tax and them being able to meet this target. And on top of that, they have they set these targets for themselves. Emissions have went up, by the way. So it's not working at all. And they keep raising the cost. But where is that cost going? They're taxing the farmer who's making the food. They're taxing the, the person transporting the food. And even the, even the people who are storing the food and selling the food. At the end of the day, Canadians are paying higher costs for gas, groceries, and home heating. I'm hearing stories, and we all are hearing these really sad stories, that there's seniors in the wintertime having to turn down the heat and wear blankets because they aren't able to afford food and to heat their homes at the same time. This carbon tax has not accomplished anything except more pain for Canadians, has done nothing for the environment. And most Canadians today, and premiers, by the way, including a Liberal premier, are calling for this tax to be cancelled. And that's exactly why we're going to do that, is because we need to bring affordability back. Okay, let's, let's stay with affordability here. I'm going to go back to the environmental uh, argument that you're making. But in terms of affordability, though, it seems then that this is how you're going to address affordability. This, this, the carbon tax is almost seen by the party as the magic bullet. To, to, to make things more affordable, or is there more that your party is going to be releasing? Because it seems that that pain is deeper than just what this carbon tax, as you argue, is creating. Absolutely right. This is going to be multifaceted because of after eight years of Justin Trudeau, we ha there's such a big mess to clean up. But any up. specifics, though, at of, this point? Of course. Let's take a look at Justin Trudeau's record. He's, he has accumulated more debt than every single prime minister before him combined. And what did that do? The higher deficits that they ran led to higher inflation that led to higher Bank of Canada's interest rates. And now Canada's at the at most at risk in the G7 for a mortgage default crisis. We need to reverse course. We need to reduce the deficit, which would reduce inflation. 
and reduce the mortgage costs that we're seeing. Housing costs have doubled in this country, whether it's rent, mortgages, or the amount it takes to save up for a down payment on a house. We need to reduce that deficit, which would in turn save people's homes, first of all, but we can bring down mortgage and rents. Is that quick enough, though? Because I, I understand that might be the goal and the, the tone with which you say you'll, you'll approach government if and when you actually get there. But that seems to be a more long-term challenge. It's not like it will immediately relieve people's uh, bottom line month to month at this point. Well, look, the other part of this whole thing is housing. What we're proposing, we have, a, we have a really good plan in order to get more supply into the country immediately. One of those is converting these thousands of vacant land and buildings into units. We can overnight almost uh, turn get more units, which would help sup the supply issue. Does that imply government investment, though, to make that happen? Uh, this would be from private. This would be we would sell off the lands and and work with governments the, on the local level to make sure that we're fast-tracking those permits, which also goes with the, with the policy that we're going to bring in to incentivize municipalities to increase permitting. We know Canada, under Justin Trudeau, is 64th in permitting. This is for big critical infrastructure projects that would help our low uh, productivity, but also for housing. We need to make sure we get more houses built. I come from the home building industry, and I know for a fact that on a municipal level, it's those gatekeepers, it's the red tape, it's the bureaucracy. We need to incentivize municipalities to get permits opened and closed, and we need to get keys into doors in order to bring in more supplies so that we can get more people into more homes. Right now, we're seeing international students living under bridges, living in tents. This isn't the Canada, Canada that me and my family moved to. It was a Canadian dream. There was a really good deal when me and my family moved here for a lot of immigrants and newcomers. That Canadian dream is broken under Justin Trudeau, and under Pierre Pauly of government, we're going to bring that Canadian dream back. Okay, you, you talk about deficits. Does that mean then deep cuts? And if it is, what, what do you think can be cut off of the government agenda right now in order to bring the deficit down? Well, we're going to bring a dollar for dollar law. Any politician will, that is wanting to spend a dollar will have to find a dollar of saving. Because of Justin Trudeau's disastrous record, Households and businesses are having to do that. Why shouldn't government have to do that? Why do, why do, why do politicians have this free credit card, on, and the, which is not really free for the taxpayer? We need to bring that law into for politicians, and that's exactly what we're going to do. We saw that happen under the Bill Clinton administration, and they were able to bring in balanced budgets. On top of that, we're going to cut things like uh, Justin Trudeau's uh, you know, liberal-friendly uh, McKinsey, who are getting billions of dollars in contracts. There's $22 billion going into contracts for consultants. And why? Because the Liberal ministers are too incompetent to do their jobs. We're seeing the more bloat in the public service, but less services being delivered to Canadians that they deserve. We need to, we're going to get I'm rid sorry, of those consultants. does that mean you'll cut the public service? We are going to get rid of these consultants and make sure that we're more efficient with our services. Canadians deserve if there's, if there's that much being spent on our public service, Canadians deserve that service back to them. And that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing immigration uh, record of uh, uh, immigration backlogs at 2.4 million, the most in Canadian history. That's keeping families separated. Businesses aren't able to get the labor that they deserve. Productivity, like I explained under Justin Trudeau, is, is second worst in all developed nations. This is the slowest growth rate that we've seen in productivity since the Great Depression. Since the 1930s, we need to bring up productivity again. Canadians deserve a government that's responsible, that will keep the tax rate low, and that will make sure that we keep out of business so that we can have businesses flourish and families flourish. Okay, I apologize jumping in quickly, running out of time, but I do want to quickly circle back to what you're talking about, the environmental policy when it comes to the carbon tax. Uh, because, you know, the, yes, they missed the target, but it was within 1.8%. Getting closer, uh, liberals would argue because of environmental policy. In fact, we heard Stephen Gimbo yesterday say that what you want to do with a carbon tax will actually turn back the clock and any environmental gains this country has made. So does that mean with this government, the environment's going to take a back seat? Look, first of all, let me just say, I'm glad Stephen Gilbo was standing outside the building, here outside here, and not scaling the building. This is the same minister that's causing, help causing so much pain on, on Canadians. Let's, and let's be clear, the, the Liberals do not have a, an environmental plan. 
Right now they have a tax plan. The only plan that they have for the environment is their carbon tax. And like I said, it's done nothing to help well, Canadians. Well, well, there is a transition to electric vehicles, and that is partly tied to a carbon tax that the world is turning away from carbon emitting vehicles. Which, which is going to take me back vehicles. to the problem about this current government. Nothing can get built here, no projects can get built here because of their bad policies like Bill C-69. We, what we're going to do is implement through technology and not taxes. We want to be able to make sure we green light green projects like hydro projects, nuclear projects, which by the way, Stephen V. Bull finally admits we do need nuclear to get to net zero. And on top of that, we're going to make sure that we fast track these projects. Like I said, we're 64th in permitting. Mm -hmm. We're not going to help bring down emissions. And you know what a great way to bring down global emissions is? But, but sorry, and I'm sorry to interrupt because I am running out of time, but here is a government that has signed deals with a conservative, progressive conservative government, uh, billions of dollars in battery plants to develop a, a mine resource, a manufacturing resource, all in Canada tied to green technology. So, so you say that, you know, they, they have not permitted anything. They've actually signed major deals, uh, they would argue, to, to create future prosperity. So, and also conservatives in Ontario would argue, not just the local government. So let, let's be clear. Um, great on promises. We'll give uh, A to the Liberals, A on promises. We'll give them F on delivery. Once again, that is not a, an environmental plan. That is not an environmental plan whatsoever. That does not correlate to lower emissions in Canada. What we need to do... Eventually. We, we need to fast track real productivity in this country. The reason why they had to give out subsidies is because there is no investment coming into this Canada and Canada on its own. We need good private investment coming in. We're not going to do that with having the lowest growth rate and such high taxes. What we need to do is make sure our product gets developed here. It's not stopped by Bill C-69, this liberal bill that doesn't let projects get built. If we're talking about mining, you can't build a mine here. It, it, by liberals' own admission, it'll take about 25 years to even build a mine here. We need to fast track those good green projects and make sure we get our product out to the rest of the world, replace dictator oil with our low carbon intense energy that we already produce here with the highest environmental standards. That's how we're going to not just lower our emissions, which like you said, 1.8% on a global scale, but let's do that to the world so we can bring down lower emissions in the world and cripple dictators like Putin and other countries that don't have the same standards as Canada does. Jazz Singh Helen, thank you very much for the time. Really appreciate it. Thanks for your time again.